Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Well, amen, and may God bless the reading of his word and his word to us. And I'll say welcome to all of you guys and welcome all those who are watching online and those who will watch later on demand. We always love to hear uh, good feedback uh, from all of you, and if you don't have good feedback, we'll just keep it to yourself. Amen. So, <laughs> all right. uh, so glad all of you are here. If you're new to us, uh, great time to uh, uh, be checking us out here at Grace, and if I hadn't got a chance to meet you yet, I'm the senior pastor here. My name is Roy Mack, and I'd love to meet you after the service. If you've been coming for a little while, uh, and this happens almost every week, uh, I, was, I would love to meet you. So, uh, Almost every week somebody comes up and says, hey, I, I, I heard you say that. I've been coming since Easter, <laughs> you know, literally. Uh, so uh, if you're coming, I'd love to connect with you and know how to better uh, be a blessing to you. And again, if you're uh, new, one of the best things you can do is download our church app. And uh, wonderful features are there, one of which it will say right in one of the headings on the front page of the app when you open it up. Uh, today's message notes, uh, which would be uh, every weekend, uh, whatever's on the screens that you're looking at uh, will be on those notes. It'll stay up till next weekend, probably somewhere Thursday, Friday. The new one will come up. Uh, the other one will come down, but you can email it to yourself. Also encourage all of our people uh, to bring a Bible, and you can make notes in your Bible, do devotions out of your Bible, use the notes from... Uh, the app and so forth. Go to life groups that we have. There's more information about that also on the app. Uh, but it's just a great way to uh, connect and do that. If you do not have a Bible, good news, we'll give you one. All right? You just see us right after uh, church, and we would love to put a brand new Bible uh, in your hands, and you can uh, come and just join in with us uh, every way that you can. Uh, so uh, we've just started this message series, Exiles. In the letter that Peter has written to all of what he calls are exiles that are all over uh, the map. And if you have a Bible and what you see in verse 1 is all these different places that Christians have been scattered there in the first century. Uh, the title for this message, as you see on the screen, is Good News for Exiles. The Good News. So uh, if you will uh, just take a look for a second, I'm going to give you just a small review and get everybody on the same page, and I think it'll help us all in uh, moving forward. So we realize uh, 1 Peter is written uh, around 60-some-odd A.D., and there's a part of what we're doing in this series is looking at a comparison to what the first century Christians were facing and what our lives look like today 
as Christians in 2024, and there's going to be a, a plethora of similarities. You'll almost think the book was written for 2024 as we go through this. And one of the ways last week that we kind of started off this comparison, how many of you have ever got up uh, some morning and turned on the news and thought you have woke up on a different planet? Right? Like a twilight zone. What happened to my country? What happened to our culture? What's what in the world? We're shocked almost every day of the things that are happening all around us. And there is a, an incredible difference to the America that I, am growing, I have grown up in to what, uh, God bless, my grandchildren are going to be growing up in as far as spiritual advantages and so forth. So there's also a theme uh, that if you were here last week would be a paragraph. But one of the themes to just shorten it down and to say it is this. There is encouragement that Peter is giving uh, the first century Christians and us to rejoice even in the difficulties, even in the hard times, to rejoice and still go ahead and live holy and above reproach in a hostile world, in a world that is hostile toward believers. We're still to live above that reproach and to live in a way that is godly and so forth. And then also you can more fully identify with Jesus, who himself was an exile. So much of the Bible uh, that you're, you begin reading in the Old Testament and right in the book of Genesis, you realize Abraham is an exile, uh, Isaac is an exile, Jacob is an exile, Joseph is an exile, you get in the, the other prophets, Daniel is an exile, the Jewish nation becomes exiles. Uh, this is a theme that just is all through the scriptures. And when you yourself realize this world is not my home, but there is another home for me, you'll come to realize that you are an exile, meaning here's all the English words that are, are exile. Sojourner, foreigner, alien, right? All, all those things. You, you're, you're in a world of which after you become a follower of Christ and you're born again by the living hope he talks about right out of the first few verses, you find yourself in a position of, I do not belong here. <laughs> but yet here I am. So there is a job to do and there is a commission given and so forth. So uh, exiles can get discouraged. And part of the bulk of the message last week is how to not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged in living here as an exile, as a stranger, as a foreigner, as an alien to this place. Because why? Because we're not home yet. And so one of the key verses that we want to look back into is 1 Peter 3 and 4. And let's just catch some of these to get caught up. So here's a, a key thing of how he's going to build his letter. He's writing to the exiles. That's what he calls them. And according to his, God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. I don't know if I have much coming uh, in way of inheritance in this world, but I can tell you I hope it's going to look a whole lot better in the next. Amen? Uh, and it's undefiled there, unfading. Uh, it's kept in heaven for you, so don't be discouraged. There's something awaiting you. Verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, uh, and it has been necessary in my life a few times, to have been grieved by various trials. Anybody had a trial in your life that really grieved you to go through? Right? Uh, that's every one of us. It's the it's part of the human condition. And verse 7 says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, you don't know what you have in your own faith until it has been tested to a point you question everything you knew about life and about God and about everything else because you don't have a testimony until you've had a test. You have to go through something to know what you have is really real in your life. So I mentioned last week that 1 Peter is also called the book of Job for the New Testament. Most of you are familiar with the, what's in the book of Job. If you're new to the Christian faith, it's Job. <laughs> oh, Job there in the Bible is Job. And uh, man, just in one day, uh, everything's gone. Every business has failed, the crops are gone, the cattle are gone, the sheep, the camels, everything has been stolen. Uh, the children are all together in one place, ten of them, the house collapses and all the children are gone. And 
Job is sitting in sackcloth and ashes, and then his health is then gone. I mean, everything, everything. And yet, um, he doesn't curse God. Yet, he puts his faith where it's supposed to be. So this, this idea is mainly about misplaced hope. And Job is helping Old Testament uh, believers here and us understand you better have your hope in the right thing. It can't be in your possessions and in your family and relations and so forth. Even the pleasures of life, the things of life, even in the relationships. It must be in God. And First Peter picks that up. But Job 18 says, Can papyrus, which we call that Nile grass in our day, little thin, flimsy little water plant, can it, can, uh, it only grows where there's, uh, it can't grow where there's no marsh. Can reeds, and again, a water plant, flourish where there's no water? While yet in flower and cut down, they wither before any other plant. You cut one of them, it just almost immediately withers because it has to be setting in water to flourish. Verse 13, such are the paths of those who forget God. If your hope is in this world and you are forgetting God, well, then you're just like that plant. As soon as you're uprooted, you just wither. And the hope of the godless shall perish. His confidence is severed and his trust is as a spider's web. The characteristic of a spider's web is it's thin and flimsy. You don't see a spider web and put your hand on it for obvious reasons, but you don't lean on it. Why? Because it'll just tear right down. It won't hold anything up. And then he leans against his house, but it does not stand. He lays hold of it, but it does not endure. Uh, I think everyone would understand too if you have a wall built and there's no support studs and it's not attached to anything and you go to lean on it with your weight it just falls over because there's nothing there uh, to support it so just like certain plants are made to grow and flourish and water cannot grow on dry ground that is the lives of people who are not planted in God and their hope is not in God and who is the giver of hope and of life hope when placed in here in this world as thin as a spider's web or as flimsy as a, a wall with no stud walls, uh, stud support in it. So the people that Peter is writing to here, they were losing hope. They were losing hope. Word has come back to Peter. This is where they're, where they're at. Most of their earthly inheritance is, is uh, going away from them. And it's just like today, uh, so many of us here in America, what is most of us, our greatest investment and our highest hope is to have a house paid for one day. It takes about a lifetime to do it for most of us. But that's our hope, right? That's the greatest financial investment that we have with most of our security is wrapped up in that. Well, again, when you realize these people, many of them are having to leave their homes, their financial inheritance and blessing that they wanted to hand down to their children is going away because they're being persecuted out of their community, which means out of their home, and they're going to other places. Some of them had already had happened. Others, it's about to happen to a point that Christianity for a season is going to be illegal, and they're going to be martyred for their faith, many of them. And so right now, they're at the kind of the starting days of that in the timeline of when this is written, and they're, they're losing their main possession. They're losing their inheritance. And you'll see as we read through uh, how that really unfolds here. So uh, they have nothing in this world in which to pass down to their children, grandchildren, and so forth. Perhaps Peter was reminded of Jesus' words uh, when Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler who came, you'll remember, in Mark chapter 10... The rich young ruler has come. He falls down uh, as if he's going to worship Jesus, but it was kind of all a facade. And Jesus knows, he knows him. He knows his heart. And, uh, you know, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him part of the commandments, but not all the commandments. And one of the commandments he left out is the one he really wanted to make him aware of. You'll have no other gods before me. But he talks about these other commands that he knew the boy was doing. He was honoring his parents and, you know, he hadn't killed anybody and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I've kept all these from my youth. He said, well, just one thing you lack, son, go sell all that you have and come and follow me. And he went away sad. And Jesus was pointing out, you have a God in front of me and I'll have no other gods in front of me, right? You're worshiping your possessions. And he wasn't willing to give up his possessions to follow Jesus. Do you see how that could just be written right into what Peter is saying? 
So Peter is now thinking about that. And remember what Peter said to Jesus. It's Mark 10, verse 28. And he said, and Peter began to say to him, Jesus, see, we've left everything and followed you. Oh, we laid it all down. You, you said, follow you. I left the fishing business, left my house, left the relationships. I'm following you. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is a, no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake or the gospels that not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Some of our blessings for serving the Lord are going to come in this lifetime, but so much more will be in the life to come. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands. Watch the word here with persecutions. <laughs> if you get something here in this world that's a blessing from God, well, let's say this. If it's financial, I promise you this, it will be taxed. Yeah. Amen? They're not going to miss anything there. Uh, and in the age to come, though, but you have eternal life. But many who were first will be last and the last shall be first. So people who are living for this world only, amassing everything that they can, well, they may be first today, but there will be a day in heaven. They're going to be last. But those sometimes who have given up so much to follow after Christ, to serve God, to live sacrificially, well, they may look like they're last right now, but one day they'll be first. And that's just the way the kingdom is set up. So you and I are, are following Jesus. We have an inheritance that is coming. Uh, it may not all, of course, be here in our exile. Now, uh, God give you all an imagination. Most of you discovered it somewhere about three or four or five years old. And so I want to ask you to exercise your God-given imagination this morning for just a, a few moments. Uh, and this will be a fun exercise, and you'll enjoy it, I promise. Nothing tricky about this at all, okay? Um, I can see by your smiles that you're excited about it. All right. Uh, uh, imagine, if you will, that you have a distant relative uh, who uh, we're here on the East Coast. Let's say he's California. And you really know of him, but he has really followed you, and he thinks a lot of you. And he wrote you into his will, but you didn't really have any idea he thought these things of you, and you had no idea all that he had. And so one day you get a certified letter that comes to your house, and, um, you know, uncle whoever has passed away, and his executor is notifying you that he has left you $100 million. I'm waiting on you to get happy. I said imagination. It's your imagination, right? $100 million. What would you do with $100 million? Now, we kind of play that game, you know, we watch the lottery, you know, I don't play the lottery, but I'll, I watch the news, and then one of the last segments is, here comes the, this ball, that ball, and I'll start guessing them, like, could I have won this? <laughs> and, you know, it's $100 million or $200 million, whatever the case is, have you ever done that, uh, uh, hey, hon, what would you do with that money, right? What would you do with the money? And I know there are certain people who said, well, it would, not, it would not change me. I would be the same. Shut your nasty mouth. <laughs> right? You lie, you lie. I'm telling you, it would change me. <laughs> not my heart, not my beliefs, not, but it would show up. Amen, you kidding? $100 million not going to show up somewhere in your life? I, I, I know that it would. So anyway, you get the certified letter. $100 million has been left to you. There's a couple of caveats that are there in the certified letter. One is you have to get to California, and you need to sign off on all the documents, and it's going to take about 12 months to get it all through, maybe probate and all the different things that are there. And then, uh, but it's signed off guaranteed. You've got $100 million. Let's say it's January right now. It's 2024, and you know that, hey, Merry Christmas. December 24, you're going to have $100 million in your... Merry Christmas. Amen? Let me ask you this. What kind of year would 2024 be for you? Do you think you would think about it a little bit? Right? You would think about it. You would keep that certified letter, if not on you, in a very safe place, lockbox the whole thing. But you would take that letter out every so often and would read it. And here's mainly when you would read it. When an unexpected bill came. Oh my goodness, the water bill is up 50 bucks this month. Right? And what would you do before you knew you had $100 million? Turn the water off, kids. Right? Get out of the shower. 
Did you, did you, I know, listen, dads, dads, look at me. Have you ever got your kids together? I've lined all four of my daughters up before. So there's a switch here on the wall. Look. Right? When you walk out, you, when you come in, you... Why? Because all that counts. But now if you get an unexpected bill, what would you do now? You got $100 million coming. Who cares, right? All this happened, that happened. Barring a health issue or so forth, you, it, everything would be fine. What, you, you could not be discouraged, for the most part, knowing what you had coming. Do you get an idea at least what this letter now is about? $100 million coming, certified letter. I want to tell you that we have, what we have in heaven waiting on us would make $100 million no more than a roll of pennies. No more than a roll of pennies. Do you realize asphalt in heaven is pure gold? <laughs> That's what my Bible says. The stinkiest old thing on your body is your nasty foot. The nastiest, stinkiest thing on our body is going to stand on the most precious thing this world can offer us, pure gold. A hundred million dollars is going to be no more than a roll of pennies. And so how do you know that? I have a certified letter <laughs> from my father amen. amen certified letter and the idea is when I'm discouraged I need to open up and remember it's all good it's all good why be discouraged I, I, I have all this coming I have a, a new life and a, an incredible inheritance and all this is here do you think the people in the first century when they got Peter's letter do you think that letter was precious to them I'll tell you, I think every time they gathered somewhere, it kind of went like this uh, to, to the elder or pastor or some leader. That, hey, would you get Peter's letter again and read it, please? Would you read it again? Tell me what it says. Talk about that inheritance one more time because I've left everything I've ever owned to follow after Jesus. Would you remind me that it will be worth it? Would you read it again? Please tell me what it says. I think they did their best to memorize it, that it was precious to them, and all of those different things. And by the way, it should be just as cherished by you because it reminds us what we have going forward. Verse 8 now. We have not seen him, but we believe in him and love him. Now, I can preach over in West Virginia or East Tennessee somewhere and talk about no one has ever seen God and somebody, oh, I've seen him, you know, but... It's safe in Ohio. We can say none of us have seen Jesus, right? My goodness. Some of you are thinking, well, I believe I have. No. Nobody has seen God. We've not met Jesus in the flesh, but I believe by faith that he is, and his word is true, and I love him. And I love him. So we know the outcome. Do you see it? We know the outcome and rejoice in our salvation. So what is the outcome of our faith? Verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith is the salvation of your souls. I know I have an inheritance coming because he's given me his spirit as a guarantee that when this house fails or when he comes, I'm going to his house. I have a guarantee of that. And the whole thing, will, the transaction will be right and good when? when I pass or when he comes and then the full reality of the salvation of my soul. Verse 10, concerning this salvation. The word salvation right there in some translations will just use the word grace uh, in place of salvation because they're synonymous. The, uh, almost they're interchangeable. We are Grace Fellowship Church. We would do no wrong in saying we're Salvation Fellowship Church. It's the same wording and the same meaning. Peter uses the word grace ten times in this letter. And we know grace is the unmerited favor of God. In other words, I got something I didn't deserve. God in His grace gave me the gift of salvation. I didn't earn it, nor did I uh, work for it or anything like that. And you cannot appreciate the grace that you've been given in that salvation unless you have some idea of the hell that you have been delivered and saved from by his mercy and by his grace. We're undeserving, yet we have it. So we live, and we are to live, in the blessing of being recipients of the good news. 
of the good news. What's the good news? That Jesus has come. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And through him, we also are conquerors of those things and have a new life in him. That's good news when it came to my house, I can tell you that. Peter's readers were enduring affliction. Some of them are even going to have to face martyrdom for their faith. They're under pressure even in their own homes, some of them from a pagan, unbelieving spouse. Chapter 3, we'll talk about that. How, how does a woman who's come to faith win a husband who couldn't give two cents about Christianity? Peter will talk about that. How can we live in the affliction of uh, where we work and your boss or employer couldn't give two cents about your faith and does everything he can to make you miserable because why? Because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, we'll talk about how to work through that. And then all of these people are living in a world that is very hostile toward Christianity because it starts to look so much different than the world that they're living in. And so some of these people are wondering, why should I suffer for my faith? Is it worth the pain that I'm going through? Is it worth losing my house over? Is it worth relocating my family? Is it worth being a vagabond in the world? Is it worth really the harassment of being ostracized from my community and ostracized from my social circle and being called a weirdo? And my kids being called weirdos at school because they don't participate in all the other things that are sinful that the whoever else is caught up in. And so Peter's answer is to get them to look up from their sufferings and to look to their salvation in Christ and to say, he's worthy of my life. He's worthy of everything this world could give me. And if I see how great a salvation I've been given, then it will be okay. And so what he's going to go into now in verses 10, 11, and 12 is things like this. The prophets, the Old Testament prophets, all those names in your Old Testament. I'm talking about the Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea. All those different names, all of them could not fully understand what you are enjoying. And that is knowing God personally and the Spirit of God living inside of you. Notice that they could not understand how, how, how could the Messiah come and suffer? How, how would he die? And even Peter did not understand that, nor all the disciples. And you remember from our study in the book of, uh, going through the book of Mark, when Jesus said, I'm going up to Jerusalem three different times. I'm going up to Jerusalem. I'll be delivered to the hands of the Gentiles. I will be mocked and crucified and buried. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Well, they didn't hear that latter part. Peter just snatches Jesus by the arm and pulls him aside and says, you are not going up to Jerusalem and dying. You will not do that. What was Because it didn't line up with what Peter thought the Messiah should do and be. And Peter's mind is, let's go up here, overthrow Rome, and we'll set up your millennial kingdom, and you'll rule the whole world, and we'll be on your council. Because that's what the Messiah is supposed to do. And by the way, that will happen. Peter was just 2,000 years wrong. Right? So uh, it doesn't mean these... Uh, people in the Old Testament were not saved. They just couldn't understand it the way you and I can understand it and follow it. So they lived in the hope of the Messiah coming. We live in the hope of the Messiah coming back. You see the difference? We have all of those things. The good news that has been brought to us as exiles, we receive the gift of salvation and we get to participate in carrying the good news to the rest of the world. To the rest of the entire world, we get the blessing and responsibility of all of those things to evangelize the whole world uh, by that. So the question arises when we suffer, well, what if Christianity isn't really true? What if I'm just believing in some myth? What if I just got caught up in some kind of emotionalism or some purely something uh, psychological? What if I'm suffering for nothing? And by the way, you get hit hard enough in the mouth for the cause of Christ, you'll start wondering, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? Peter's answer is that our salvation is rooted in all the prophecies that these men and women made in the Old Testament. It's rooted there. And then Jesus has come and fulfilled it by dying on the cross, being buried, raised again on the third day, being seen alive for the next 40 days, 
right? And then the day of Pentecost has come when Peter preached and these lives are being transformed and these wonderful things are happening. He said, look, it's all happened like Jesus said it would happen. Like all these people in the Old Testament said it would happen. It's true. It's all true. Even the angels in the latter part of verse 12, even the angels longed to look at it. They looked over the palaces of heaven and said, I don't know how God is going to become flesh. I don't know how he's going to redeem mankind. I don't even understand. The angels would love to know what you and I get to experience. We get to have the Spirit of God in us. You realize in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come on like one person, like Samson, and this incredible strength comes on Samson. He kills a thousand enemies and rips up the gates from the city and carries them up on a hill and plants them on a hill. Uh, you know, that's God's strength coming to him. It's God's spirit coming on David. He slays Goliath, cuts off his head. He writes the Psalms. You realize the spirit is just being poured out of his heart of love. And so it's just one person. They could not understand or the angels could understand how God is going to give the spirit of God to everyone who believes. It's a great mystery. You realize the God that spoke the world into existence when you become a believer lives in you? We could just dismiss right there and go home and think about that for a month and then come back. But I don't trust that you'd do that, so go stay in here. So what this section of Scripture now does is invites us to meditate on these things. Think long and hard about the Spirit of God living in you, how that for millennia, the holiest, most righteous people desired to know it. And you have the Spirit of God living in you. Now watch, verse 13, he says, therefore. And you know, a rule of Bible study, when you see a therefore, you must ask yourself, what is it there for? So the way Peter writes his letter, and I'll explain it in a little more detail next week, is that he writes in a way that causes us to continually go back and reread what we've read. In other words, there, therefore what? i got to go back. Therefore, because by his great mercy you've been born again by a living hope that Christ lives in you by his spirit and you have an inheritance that has been given to you that is not going to be taxed, that is not going to go away, that you cannot be, it cannot be taken away it is going to be there in heaven, and it's worth everything you'll ever give up on this world. And you can rejoice in it coming and the certainty of it coming. Now the next ten verses are how to live. Knowing all that, then here's how you should live as an exile who has the good news. You're an exile, but you've got the good news. I, you, listen, there's plenty of bad news around us. Amen, amen. Everywhere I, I can't find good news on the news. Somebody rescued a cat out of a tree. That's about the good news that we get today. Where is the good news? The good news doesn't reside in this world. How are you to live with the good news as an exile? So one of the themes, again, of 1 Peter centers around an understanding that ought to be pointed out to every, every Christian and every church, particularly the churches that would acknowledge that they have come out of what we would call the Reformation and see, there was a time uh, up until the 1500s, and we have a, hundreds of years that were called the Dark Ages. You, you don't have to get that out of your Bible. You can get that out of the history book. What were the Dark Ages? What main thing symbolized the Dark Ages? It was the Dark Ages because the Word of God was illegal. The only person who could read the Word of God legally was a priest of certain types of churches, orthodox type of churches. And if you, as a Christian, got a hold of a Bible some way, somehow, and started trying to copy it or distributing it or reading it, you, they'd burn you alive. Y'all did go to school, right? You remember this. That's what they did. What was your crime? Spreading the Word of God. You can't understand the Word of God. They didn't want you to understand the Word of God. There was certain power and control that was held by what we would just call priests that were the common man can't understand this and we can't copy it, can't distribute it, can't give it out, which was not of God. But Satan had hundreds of years in which he dominated the world. 
particularly uh, out, out of Europe where the Bible was not accessible. And anybody that copied the Bible and did that was burned to the stake, beheaded, all kinds of horrible things, tortured uh, for that crime of loving the Word of God and wanting to spread the Word of God. And so in the time of the Reformation, we have Martin Luther, who is a Catholic priest who is reading his Bible one day, and he realizes that salvation is not in the institution of the Catholic Church or any other church, but salvation is by grace through faith, right? Not of works, lest any man should boast. Some of the things you would read about here in 1 Peter, he's seeing all this. Well, we're not saved because a church says that we're saved. We are saved. Why? Because we put faith in Christ. And he nails his thesis on the door and kind of the rest is history. So the Reformation uh, has, has then uh, started. And then in, in short order, it got to be okay that you could have the Word of God and read the Bible. And here is the issue that went along for lots of years, and it's the main issue why Christians were, I'm talking about Christ's followers were executed for their faith was over this one belief. It was called the personal priesthood of the believer. Peter talks about that and it's developed in the next two chapters. Every person who knows Christ as Savior is a priest. And you're to live holy, separated from this world as a priest yourself. You do not need another priest to go confess your sins to. You are a priest and Jesus is our high priest and you confess your sins to God and he can forgive you. Man has no ability to forgive you. Everybody's a priest. Everybody that knows Christ is to be holy and separated from this world for God's use. Can I just say this to you? You're to be a priest in your neighborhood. You're to be a priest in your home. You're to be a priest at your school and at your work. That don't mean a holy Joe walking around giving sermonettes to everybody. I'm talking about you don't need your neighbor's permission to pray for your neighbor. You can pray for their health, their marriage, their blessing. You can pray God open up their heart and expose them to the gospel and even help you to be the deliverer of that gospel. I've prayed for a lot of people for years that I'm just now having the spiritual conversations with. Two of my doctors this week, after years, one of them out of the blue says, so what's the difference in what you believe and what the Catholic Church believes? Because he was a Catholic. I said, well, I'm glad you asked. And sitting on an exam table, I talked for 15 minutes of what it meant to know Christ and how you could know Christ and do that. Another one of my doctors read my book and caught me in the hospital the other day and said, you've given me a lot to think about. I said, I intend for you to think about it. When you're ready to talk about it, you know where I'm at. Amen? I didn't ask them if I could pray for them. I just started praying for them. My first prayer was, God help them not let me die, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can be a priest in that way. Uh, <clears throat> the idea is when you do this, it takes the, the focus off of yourself. You know what we are is just as people in our raw condition. We're very selfish. We are. We, we think about us, we want us to do whatever. The hardest command of all of Scripture even when Jesus was asked what's the greatest commandment, it's certainly the hardest commandment because you know what he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and strength and mind and soul. And then the second is likened to it, to love your neighbor as yourself. When you start focusing on Jesus, the next thing that's going to happen is you'll start to care about the people around you. And you'll think less of yourself and more of the people who are around you. If you want to know why you don't care about anybody but you, is because you're not focusing on loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because when you see Him for who He is, your immediate reaction will be, I must share the gospel with my neighbors. With, I must care for them. I must help them. If they're in need, I, I, I need to do something and be a part of those kinds of things. So the application of this command is directly rooted in understanding of God and His people and their relationship with the rest of the world. We're all to be priests. We're all to be intercessors for those around us. I taught for years in my church in Atlanta uh, for all of our men. We had what we call prayer partners there. 
I said, the first thing I want every man to do in our church is to pray for everybody on their pew or the row or their chair that they're sitting by. Here's how that looks. Somebody comes in, sits down on the end of those seats. You don't know them. First thing is, you ought to get to know them. But the second thing is, if they're a brand new guest or somebody's come in, God, please speak to them today in this message. I pray nothing would distract them. I pray that their hearts would be open to hear the gospel. Do you need permission to do that? That priestly good work? No, just let God use you to pray for those around them. And ladies as well can do that. I'm just saying when I was just teaching men, I'd say that. So sharing the good news is what our minds are to be set on. And this is what the next verses go into. In verse 13, it, 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 the English wording will always be like this, preparing your minds for action. Get your mind ready to do something for God. We can all get that. The King James language, the old language, would be gird up the loins of your mind. And it takes on different imagery, and I don't want you to be lost in the imagery. It's important to have this. Luke 12, verse 35 King James Bible says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And so today we're like, what the heck are they talking about? I don't even know what my loin is, right? Well, it's kind of around here, okay? <laughs> so your loins to be girded up. This was, the imagery was simply this. Uh, even a Roman soldier, what was the dress for a man in first century? Well, it was a dress. <laughs> How about that? That was the dress. They didn't have pants. They had some kind of a I hate the language, but a skirt of some kind. Big leather belt. So preparing and girding up your loins was this. I'm about to fight. I'm about to run. I'm about to need my legs not to be inhibited by anything. So a man would reach down and grab the back of that, pull it up, right tied around his legs, and tuck the excess of it into his leather belt. And now he can run, fight, do whatever. He was preparing himself for a battle. It's talking about being ready to do something, be ready to do something. It has its roots all the way back into the Passover. In the book of Exodus, God gave Moses how they were to eat that first Passover when the death angel was going to pass over and God was going to deliver Israel, the nation, out of Egypt as he promised. Thus you shall eat the Passover with your, what? Loins girded. You're, in other words, get ready. Get ready. You're not entangled by anything. Put your shoes on, get your staff in your hand, and eat it like this. And when you're done, we're getting on up out of here. Be ready to move. Like Minutemen in the Revolutionary War. You guys remember that? In one minute, can every man be called upon to have his gun loaded and his go bag packed and ready to get at it? If called upon in one minute to be ready. That is the haste that we are to have in sharing the gospel and our minds to be ready for that. You'll see as we go through the book, uh, you know, we're, we're to be able to give a, the answer to anybody who asks us the hope we have in Christ Jesus. That's what Peter is going to tell us later. So, verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Do you remember when you lived in your ignorance? Few of you can. Right? You didn't know what you didn't know. You didn't know that you needed to be saved. And our community, for the most part, is... I, I think there are some rejectors that are out there. Certainly they are. And they even do that out of their ignorance. There's a difference in ignorance and stupidity. When you share the truth with somebody and then they reject it, that's stupid. But if they're just ignorant of it, it means they're, they're unlearned of it. They, did, they didn't know. And a lot of our community is ignorant. They live in ignorance and... We're to go share the truth of God's word and to help them to be delivered as we were once delivered. And so this book is written literally in, from Rome. Peter is writing in Rome, of which he symbolically call, calls it in chapter 5 as he signs off from Babylon. Well, Babylon didn't exactly exist in this day, but Rome was synonymous for Babylon. What is it? It's full of idol worship and pagans and sexual immorality and debauchery. Here's what Rome was in the first century. See if it sounds familiar with the day you and I are living in. It was full of homosexuality. It was full of sexual confusion. People desired to have sex with children. Nothing was off limits. And it was done out of what? Out of ignorance. Out of complete ignorance. Drunkenness, sexual orgies, rampant 
sin in every way, Paul would write to that church in Rome and tell them in chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be like that. Be transformed by the renewing and renewal of your mind that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. The idea is we're not to be controlled or confused or conformed by or drawn to our culture around us. We're not to be led neither by our desires and our former passions and our own needs and all those kinds of things because lots of that is just trends of the culture that is just coming because the sin we're seeing around us today is not new on the earth. Their sin has always been like this. We're to rule over our own behavior, appetites, and passions. And this is the major problem with most all of the sinful, sinful sexual misconduct that we have in our world today. Because here's what it looks like. Well, I know that I'm really a boy, but I want to be a girl, or I'm a girl and I want to be a boy, or behave as such, or I identify as a cat or a donkey or whatever else anybody wants to identify as. And we rally out and we go, I want to do what I want to do. I want to be me. I want to express what's in my inward part. And most of our culture is going, well, they, well okay. You, you be you, boo, right? I mean, if that's what you feel like, you, you can do that. And there, there's this ignorance that is there that we don't understand that we're defying the very God who made us a certain way and dreamed a great dream for our lives. And we want to be something different. And then well, let's give everybody surgery and let's make them what they're not and all of this stuff. And here's the rally cry behind all of it. I want my rights. I ought to have the right to do what I want to do. It's my decision. We pour that over into other questionable things that are uh, debated about today. I want my rights. I want my way. It's my way. It's my way. It's my way. Well, let me let you know something. You ever notice this? Some of the same people, when you challenge them with the gospel, they'll say, well, I am a Christian. Really? That's amazing. Because my Bible tells me that when you become a Christian and you put faith in Jesus Christ, it's no longer about you. You gave up all your rights. Here's what it looked like. My life is now crucified with Christ. All my desires, all my rights, everything else, and it was buried. Buried, gone, forever gone, and I raised up and I'm following after Christ who's given me his life. Not my life anymore. Not my desires. Not just where I want to go, where I want to live, what I want to do. Now it's about what he wants to do in me. Even Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. and Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ who lives in me. All my rights went away. And you get somebody starting to talk about their rights and what they want, and my ears just plug. I'm thinking, you do not know the Jesus of the Bible. You do not know it because when you start knowing him, all that dies and goes away and it becomes about him and them and no longer about you. You're welcome. You're to have his mind. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus also. I can't imagine my Savior identifying as a cat and defecating in a litter box. I cannot imagine my Jesus wanting to say, oh, I want to be something else. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, but since we belong to the day, I got to live today. I can't live a thousand years ago or in the future. I, I have today. I'm living today. Well, I better be sober. Let us be self-controlled is what that means. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. So the Holy Spirit is in us to help us and aid us. It doesn't force our action. The Holy Spirit is available to be something we can lean into and lean on and we can have our hope and our security and stand for God in a world that's hostile toward anybody that doesn't agree with them. Peter's not speaking down when he says he calls them obedient children. He's drawing from another one of Jesus' sayings in Matthew 18. Remember Jesus gets that little child sets in front of them. The context of that is they were all talking about, well, I'm, who's the greatest in the kingdom? I think I'll be the greatest. What about you? No, Matthew, you're not going to be the greatest. Peter's going to be the greatest. No, John thinks he's going to be the greatest. Jesus set a child down and said, unless you turn and become like little children, you can't even enter the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean you're not going to be saved. It just means you can't even walk in the kingdom. You're nobody we're going to build the kingdom with. But if you humble yourself and become obedient like a child, you know one of the characteristics of a child? They just believe what their parents say. 
Do they not? How, how, why do they believe that? Because that's just the child's heart. That's the humbleness of a child. At a certain age, that, that they get to be talking back and all that. We know that. That's when they start looking like me and you. But there's a while you can say up is down and they'll believe it. Why? Because my daddy said. Good enough for me. Oh my goodness. Where does the time go? 1 Peter 1 verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So here's that deal back to the priest. Peter is saying all of you are to be priests. That will be developed in the second chapter, by the way, if you're looking for that exact wording. I want you to be holy. Why? Well, because he's holy. You shall be holy for I'm holy. Talking about God. Ten times in the book of Leviticus, you read that statement. You be holy as I'm holy. Uh, here again, Peter's drawing on this teaching that we all can be priests. Holy set apart in, in uh, use for God. Like the, holy, uh, like the tabernacle was set apart, was holy. Again, in the next couple of uh, messages, we'll talk about that in detail in chapter 2. You're to be that Old Testament tabernacle, but now you're a New Testament tabernacle. You're a priest. You remember the song we just sang a little bit ago? He's our cornerstone. Where do we get the wording for that? Well, it's Jesus' words, and Peter then quotes it again. He's the, he's the stone in which the builders rejected. He came into his own, and his own received him not. We don't want to build with you, Jesus. That's, the, that's, that's what the world says. That's what religion says. But he's the cornerstone, and we're, in the next chapter, we're the lively stones. We're the, the holy priest that he is going to build his house upon, and it's how we're going to advance the gospel. You and I are going to get uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, what does uh, some of this mean today? Well, you can be an intercessor, right? We talked about that. So everything you're involved in, you're to be holy therein. And if you're not, if you can't be holy in some activity that you're involved in, guess what? You're involved in some activity you shouldn't be involved in. You shouldn't be involved in it if you can't be holy in it. Uh, why be holy, you may ask? Because God, your Father, according to verse 17, is going to judge impartially. I know Jesus is your friend and all that, and we've kind of turned that into our buddy, and you and Jesus got your own thing going on, but I want to tell you, he's still your judge. And if you do not behave yourself in a way that is lining up with Scripture as a Christian, he'll bring some things into your life that will cause you some pause and some difficulty and judge you in the spot that you're in, to help your heart and mind align with him so you will not be a reproach on this earth as you walk through and be a bad billboard for what it means to be a Christian. Our lives are to be sanctified and set apart. Why, you may ask. I'm glad you asked. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. You know what you were bought with? His very lifeblood. How could you not be precious in God's sight if he literally shed his blood to buy you out of the hole in which you were in? He, he ransomed you back to himself by the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the rest of the gospel is in those verses. That, that, that what? It was that he, he foreknew him. He died before he framed the world. In God's mind, Jesus was already ransomed before he ever spoke the world into existence. And he raised him from the dead and gave him glory that you may have faith and hope in God. The sin debt was paid again, not with perishable temporal things, but with the very precious blood of God. The good news is that Jesus has given his life to redeem us to himself, because that's what the good news is, right? And you, you have to know the bad news for you can get the good news. I was... I was dead in my sins and on my way to hell where I'd be separated forever from God. And in his mercy, he brought the gospel to me and caused me to have a living hope and to be born again into that living hope. By his grace, I have that. Not by what I've done, not by attending a church, not by religious activities, purely out of his mercy and out of his grace, he gives this to me that I can know him and have eternity with him. That's good news. It was good news when it got to my house. Let's close it out here. Verse 22. 
having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere, watch now what's supposed to come out of our life, a brotherly love, loving one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you've been born again, not a perishable seed, but imperishable again. It ought to show up into us that I'm different because I've gotten saved. And this is the word, as it's given there in the last, is the good news that was preached to you. Paul appeals to something that you ought to give a little thought about before we go home. What's the evidence of a real conversion? Right? Here's the idea. You, I didn't give this to the other folks, so you're special. <laughs> if I buy an old, beat-up, rusted-out car, and I pay good money for it, I've bought it, it is, in a sense, born again into my family. I take possession of that car. And over the next few years, I'm going to hear the word. I'm going to convert that car and restore it into something greater than it ever was. Ownership happened in a moment. Conversion takes a little time. Everybody get it? And at the end of my long, hard toil in my shop over days, weeks, months, and years, I roll out a beautiful, you name it, SS Camaro 450 four barrel shift kit, you know, the whole thing. A beautiful car. It's converted to something that is amazing. You know what people will say? Wow. What a radical change. I remember when it was sitting on blocks and was junk. Yeah, well, it's not junk anymore. You want to go for a ride? <laughs> the evidence of a real conversion has to be a radical change. Somebody help me here. Radical change. Oh, I'm saved. What changed? Well, I started going to church a little that's not a radical change. A, a new desire and new care for others will also be what shows up in your life if you're converted. Because lost people don't care really much for anybody except their own. But all of a sudden you care about people that you wouldn't have normally give two cents about. And then there's a new direction. Not only just a direction of life direction, but a new direction of thought. You used to view the world this way, and now you view the world this way. It really should be this way. I just see things different. Why? Because the Spirit of God moved into me, and He poured His love into me, as Paul would talk about in the, to the church at Rome. And your affections and behavior would be completely different. Completely different. Well, you, now you just love people. Just love Lord, the Lord and love people. James put it this way, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. A lot of people take James 2.17 and say, well, you, that means you've got to work your way to salvation. No, that's, no, you can't work your way to salvation. Why? Because it, it, we've, every book takes time to say salvation comes by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves, lest any man should bo boast. And Ephesians chapter 2 talks about that. Your faith ought to have some works that show up because you have had faith in Christ and because you are a new creature. I didn't work to get in. I work because I am in. And then that, that, that love, you know, John talked about it in 1 John three fourteen. We know that we have passed out of death into life. We, in other words, we've been born again because we love the brethren. I love the people that go to this church. I love the people who know Jesus. He who does not love abides in death. It's so natural for us just to love ourselves and not love the other. Now, the last few verses in, in verse 24, Peter is quoting Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 6 through 8. And this chapter is really the most remarkable in showing something to us that is the sharp antithesis of human life how beautiful human life can be. What's human life compared to here? The flower of grass, beautiful wildflowers growing. You ever looked in a field that was 100 acres that is beautiful flowers? And you go, man, that's so, that's so beautiful. Well, come back in the fall. Psst, all goes away. 
but the word of the Lord remains forever. Aren't there some beautiful people in the world? I'm a straight heterosexual man. And there's some men that are absolutely so handsome that straight heterosexual men will stop and go, man, that guy is handsome. And then there are women, and most all of us will fit in this certain age group, that you just can't help it. You, you, I'll be with my wife and go, I'll even say to her, my Lord, that person looked like an angel. How, how much more beautiful could they be? And then I'll turn and go, but they're, 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 they're no comparison to you. <laughs> I just want you to agree with me. There are some beautiful people in this world. What I want you to now understand is just give them time. Right? In time, the physical will not look as it should. Everybody's going one way, and it's not younger and more beautiful and more vibrant. Hello? This statement has meant a lot to me in the last few weeks. Uh, Life Group's going to talk about a lot of things, but it's one of the statements I want you to talk about. What a thin line of human frailty lies between what life is now and the life that's awaiting for us in eternity. Just a veil. It's just a veil. We are frail exiles here. I have my next breath because God allows it. If I wake up in the morning, it's because God allowed it. He holds it. He holds it. We have a wonderful family here on the front who's lost somebody in their life, lost a mother, lost a sister, lost a daughter. And uh, I thought a lot about this, Floyd. It's just a thin veil from what was and what is. And as I said to them in the room on Saturday when their loved one went to be with the Lord, Miss Norma, they're healed now. They're better now. But it just seems like such a thin veil from what is right now to what is. James writes it and says it this way, what is life? It's just a vapor. Appears for a little bit and it's gone like a little mist that comes up over the Mediterranean and the sun comes up and it burns off and it's gone. All of our lives are that. So what becomes the most important thing? Are you born again? <laughs> Have you been born again into a, a living hope? And the idea that I've been trying to present is what Peter was trying to present. What is the evidence that you were born again? If we put you on trial for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you of such could we say well this person loved the brethren this person loved the people around them this person obviously had the spirit of God poured into them there's such a radical change in their life from what they were to what they've been converted to who but God could do this work in their life are you working at loving as you should that's something to be considered sometimes God puts difficult people in our life to help us know how to lean into him to love them. And sometimes he's counting on you to love the most unloveliest of people so they can know the love of God. I've literally had people in my life that were so rude and so obnoxious and I thought they were such a curse and I've even said to some of them to their face and in person, God is trying to help me not hate your guts. But with his help and power, I'm going to love you with all that I have and all God that can help me be. <laughs> Perhaps you've not met them. We are possessors of the good news. It's been preached to us. It's changed us. His love is poured into us. Yes, we're living in exiles, as exiles. Yes, we live in a hostile world, but we are to bear the same good news to others, whether you think they want it or not, we're to bear the same good news that changed our lives. We're the bearers of that. 
So the question, the last, are you willing to carry the good news and share it with others? Are you willing to do that? The good news for us as exiles is that our Savior is coming back. And when he comes or when I go, I'm ready. But are you? May we have our heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. And so much of the Bible circles and circles and circles and addresses so many of the same things. But it should be set to where you as a follower of Christ know that you know. You know that you know heaven's your home. So Father, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I pray you'd speak deeply to those that um, may not know you as Savior, that something is quickened in their heart when we talk about passing. Lord, if we were to die today, would we be in heaven or would we be in hell, separated you from you forever? Lord, if you were coming today, are you coming for us? And Lord, those that you are touching their heart right now, and your spirit is quickening them and drawing them to yourself. And Lord, you're speaking love to them and letting them know that you've died for them and poured out your life's blood for them. Lord, I pray you would give them that measure of faith that you have said you've given to every person that they could be saved. They could confess their sins and Lord, to put faith in you for what you've done on the cross, that you've died on the cross, you were buried and Lord, they could surrender their lives to you, bury their old self, and walk up in a new life with you at the lead. And Lord, so those that are sitting here and under the sound of my voice, perhaps even watching at home, Lord, all that are being drawn to you, I pray would receive you today. Now, if that's you with our heads bowed and eyes closed, Right where you're seated, would you just turn your life over to him? Surrender it. Let self die. Let him come alive in you. Let him pour his love into you. Let him convert you in time to something very usable and beautiful in his sight. Right where you're seated, you could pray a prayer and he could save you. You don't have to pray it out loud, but maybe a prayer like this I'll offer to you. You could pray it behind me. If it's in agreement with your spirit to his spirit, that he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Pray a prayer like this. Dear God, I do believe that you love me. And I confess that I'm a sinner. Thank you for setting me in this seat today to hear the gospel. Lord Jesus, save me. I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you were buried. Bury my old life with you and give me a new life in you. The best I know how I ask this in your name.